Hey, good morning. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we have a great crowd and uh, a great com conversation and a great topic today. I'm David Hadibus, President and CC of CCNG, and I'm here to facilitate our discussion today with you, our live audience, and our member, our guest, our discussion leader, Noel Roberts. He's the CTO and VP of Marketing with ARIA Solutions. And many of you may uh, recall his name, and you might have participated in past programs that we've done with Noel, and uh, we're happy to have him back today uh, on the channel for another live webinar discussion. Uh, you're on the CCNG broadcast channel. Uh, we've got uh, 200 to 300 uh, broadcast uh, webinars that we've done over the last 10 years, serving a community of over 7,000 contact center and customer care colleagues. So um, the, pro the approach we use on our webinars is discussion over presentation. So Noel's got some discussion content today that we're going to cover, and your role is to engage and ask questions. So hopefully we'll keep a nice balance. Today we're going to be focusing the discussion on how organizations are focused on enabling their agents and giving their frontline people the tools needed to win each customer interaction. We talk a lot about, about customer experience. Focus here is more going to be on what are we doing to help the agents to have a better experience. If you're new here to CCNG, we are a professional peer network for contact center and customer care management. For over 25 years, CCNG members and colleagues have discussed topics on process improvement, staff challenges, the impact of changing technologies, and so much more. And the broadcast channel here gives us a vehicle to continue in driving those discussions. So it's all relating to the world of managing contact center and customer care. And today, Noel's going to lead our discussion on agent enablement to improve one-on-one -on -one interactions between agent and customer. During our live webinar today, we have an audience participation poll. We want to keep you awake and alive and engaged. So uh, keep a lookout for the poll question. It's not hard. It's multiple choice. If you're looking at it from the perspective of uh, you're an industry person or a consultant, just give your viewpoint. So answer the question as best you can. If you're not involved in the decision cycle, but you know your company may have a perspective on that, answer as best you can. And we'll uh, address those on the back end, get Noel's perspective. Also throughout the day, we have the question box up on your screen you can use to submit your questions and comments. So again, not just uh, how do you do, but also uh, my perspective is X. So please use it for comments as well as questions. We'll take as many as we can um, uh, get to in our uh, presentation today, um, targeted for about oh, 55 minutes or so. So that's kind of the format. I um, want to welcome Noel back. Um, let me get things going by turning it over to you, Noel. All right. Well, thank you, David, and welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining. So in this session, I'd like to discuss you know, how to better enable your agents in this complicated world of rising customer expectations, essentially. So with that, um, talking about rising expectations, you know, really customers are still important. Uh, they have choice and clout, and they are not afraid to react if they have a bad customer experience. And uh, by reacting, they might warn others uh, of the experience they had, um, might leave the company in search of a new brand or new company to go after. So we do really need to, to pay attention to customers still and um, their experiences. They still, they still do matter. And what's kind of interesting is that um, with this Forrester survey, they've basically done surveys of customers and find, have found that the uh, scoring has remained pretty much flat over the last three years. Um, maybe it's a slight improvement since last year's report said it was in decline, but uh, here it's kind of flattening out and not really getting gaining much ground as far as customers are concerned. And that's you know, it's kind of interesting because really customer experience is still viewed as a key way to differentiate yourself from the competition. So it's still an area that needs to be focused on and, uh, 
uh, even even in light of of uh, this result. So with this um, with this talk here, and with the fact that customer experience and and customers are still important, I thought we could focus on the the customer agent sorry the agent side the uh, agent enablement side, and uh, really focus on what kind of improvements you know we could look at. Um, and I'll go into a bit more depth as to why, um, and then get into some of the the things you can do to enable the agents in specific areas, uh, and then some actions that um, that you can take. All right, so agents enablement. You know why why is it important? Well, as we obviously know, con agents contribute to the customer experience. They're key contributors. You know, they're the human face of the of the company in many situations, and they leave that strong impression with your customers and and an emotional connection um, as well. And so, by by better enabling the the uh, the agents, they can become more effective, which can translate into that increased uh, customer experience and connectedness with with um, with customers. And enabled agents are also more engaged, which makes them happier. And uh, happier agents lead to happier customers and reduced attrition and cost. So, and by engaged, kind of really meaning here, it's uh, something that's uh, evolving a bit more on the agent side. It really is that level of engagement that they have with the organization. Sort of how standoffish they are is the the reverse of that. Are they just Showing up and doing their job, or are they actually engaged and feel good about what they do and feel uh, empowered and and um, happy to be working there? So that's a level of engagement. So a bit of a personal story relating to uh, this. Um, I uh, I booked a flight uh, a few months ago, and I got offered an upgrade after after my booking, um, which I didn't take. But uh, later, when I was when I was checking in, I was offered the upgrade again. Uh, I was tempted, and I actually decided to take it that time. And when I tried to pay for it, uh, there was a problem. Uh, so I called in, and the agent said that basically they couldn't give me the upgrade uh, because their system didn't show it. it. Didn't show that I was eligible uh, for that upgrade, and it wasn't an option as far as they were concerned. And it wasn't even so much that there was a problem with them, with maybe their system. It's that the agent didn't even really seem to care, or maybe he didn't even really believe me that I could see on my screen that there were still seats available, uh, that uh, the offer was there on my screen, uh, even if I went back in again, but I could not complete the transaction, and the agent wasn't helpful at all. So this is an example of an agent that was clearly not very well engaged and uh, left me with a pretty strong emotional reaction, not a very <laughs> very positive one. And that's kind of stayed with me as I've booked other flights with them, but sort of less so kind of when I need to. And uh, they're no longer really that top choice um, of, of airline for me. So that's an example of, of um, this sort of engagement aspect and the importance of it and uh, the impact on emotion on on customers that your agents have. So, with that, another another thing that um, is going to be a reason for us to make changes to the agent environment is that uh, companies are looking to make various improvements uh, to customer the customer experience, or even to you know other things for cost uh, reduction. Um, but Really, there, there are some main reasons around customer experience that we're seeing. Uh, a lot of that is around adding more channels. Um, did a webinar a while ago about uh, the explosion of channels. Uh, so there's a lot more channels coming into play that agents um, have to contend with. And customers um, want that or expect that easy access, and so companies need to kind of meet them uh, with that expectation. Other piece of intelligent self-service, so this really is bots or virtual uh, customer assistants, or VCAs. Um, they are often used for cost reduction as a, as a key goal, but often are found that the, they produce uh, positive customer experience because uh, just adding that ease of 
of uh, access and that ease of getting things done on different channels uh, is, is really adding to CX and companies are seeing their CX related scores go up. Other improvements that they might be making include process improvements, um, might also be dealing with silos. Uh, siloed systems, data, and processes are a common hindrance to um, doing good customer experience. And of course, these things, uh, these kinds of changes that, that companies might be making affect the agents as well, right? So we've got the channel skill and culture. So by adding these new, these new channels, you introduce new skill requirements. They have to have typing versus speaking. They have to have different writing styles for the different types of channels that might be dealing with uh, SMS versus um, versus a, a web chat, for example. Um, they need to know when to use a channel versus another, you know, when to transition maybe from one channel to another. So this adds to that complexity that agents um, are contending with. And then on the bot side, the bots are adding um, more, more uh, self-service essentially of the simple, moderate kind of, kind of tasks. And that's leaving a higher percentage of the more complex uh, interactions to be handled by, by agents. We'll go over that a little bit more from an organization's perspective, um, the impact to, uh, to a company there a little later on. So that's kind of what's happening. And then some of the other things too is again uh, with bots, for example, they're adding new uh, processes, new tasks that agents need to contend with uh, well, such as handoffs from bot failures or partial bot situations where those channels might go through, um, uh, might go through to the agent. Um, so then, let's kind of focus a little bit more on how can we actually better enable uh, the agents. So we can focus on better informing your agents to help them properly identify the task that they need to do, and then better support the agents with the task and guide them through the task as well as other things like empower your agents or provide a better physical environment like headsets or chairs or monitors. Um, but in this, this uh, webinar will focus on those first three on the, on the, green, the green circles. Okay, so before we take a, a deep dive, just, um, or deeper dive anyways, we'll just go through a high level view of just an interaction very quickly. Um, so first off, when, um, when interactions uh, get going, they'll arrive at uh, an IVR or a bot. Uh, they could be self-served. They could get, um, if they're not self-served, they'll get routed to uh, to an agent. And this routing piece is what I tend to call the, the getting it there part. And then once they arrive at the agent, then we're really in the getting it done part. And that's when the uh, agent will need to handle the interaction um, execute, actually do that business task that needs to get done, and then wrap up the interaction so that they can move on to the to the next one. And so we'll focus on the um, the agent interaction handling part. Um, this can be uh, divided into about uh, uh, six steps uh, to um, to help us focus on on um, where we want to make changes. So I've broken it down into these six steps. But there are two things uh, that are core to the um, to the agent's activity, um, not not really properly highlighted here. But number two and, and number four actually. So identify which task, so really identifying what it is that they need to do, and then the second part is actually doing the work or getting it done. So number four on that list. Those are the core things that um, that an agent needs to uh, uh, needs to focus on. So to identify the task properly, uh, we need that complete picture of the customer uh, with the right information, the right relevant information. And um, that should be about the customer, but also about the context that they're in. Um, so when the interaction is answered or, or accepted, uh, this is when the agent really needs to turn their focus to the conversation with the customer and not be encumbered by, by other things. So their, their attention needs to switch and, and, and really um, not be distracted there. So you can have a screen pop um, that'll show that 360 degree view of the customer and you want that to show as quickly as possible um, and ideally within that single pane of glass. 
Uh, and then there are four types of information, really, that needs to be included in this 360-degree view and in, in the, the presentation of, uh, of information to the agent. You need to show the interaction purpose. So really, that's what they're calling about or contacting you about. The customer profile, so information about who, who they are. Uh, the current context of the customer is important. So if I'm booked on my flight or if I'm checked into my flight, uh, those different different current contexts have different meaning. Um, they could be important for the agent. And then lastly, the fourth one is the company context. And the company context can include things like if there's an outage, if I'm a service provider and there's an outage with my with my service. So power, I think, like uh, David, you experienced this morning, um, or service outages for um, cell phones or or uh, internet, that sort of thing. Um, the screen should dynamically highlight critical information. So either time sensitive information, you know, urgent info could also be things like a past due payment, something to bring the attention to that that may or may not be actually even directly related to uh, to the um, the interaction to the the type of request that's being made. You also want to be able to pass rich information, so not just uh, text information from, say, your your IVR, your bot. You want to take some of that information and make it rich. So if there's there's information that could be included, maybe around the website that, uh, page that they were on, um, or if there's information passed by a bot, such as a phone number through a, a chat, you might want to highlight that so it can be a click to call. That's all that the agent would need to do if they needed to change channels, for example. So that rich information is is um, is one item to uh, to look at. Uh, include the right supporting information. So uh, that would include things like past history of activity, any open cases or service requests that might exist with the customer, uh, purchase history. All that kind of information um, needs to be included in uh, in what's presented. And then also some guidance and assistance with the authentication step. So as part of this identification process, and before we can transition to doing the work, we probably have to do the right level of, of authentication. And I divide that into three steps, uh, or three, three possibilities. There's the identification, kind of at the weakest level, uh, a validation step, and an actual authentication step. So if you if you um, want to authenticate somebody, it's really that you want to make sure you're actually dealing with the maybe the account owner, for example. It's important to know that not every uh, request that uh, that somebody makes is going to require the same level of authentication. And so, if you need four fields to be validated, um, uh, for or four fields, sorry, to have an authentication um, occur then you might not want to use that process for every type of uh, request that comes in. And this is still a sore spot that we, we see a fair bit, is that sort of single approach to, um, uh, I could call it validation or even authentication. Um, so, so then the agent after this can um, look at uh, all this information, and then they can uh, take it all in and identify what to do, and now they can proceed. And that's the transition step. And so really here, the transition piece that, that can happen that we've, um, we've seen is in some systems, uh, an example might be that you right click on the screen, uh, a list of all the different tasks that are possible for that agent to do show up maybe in a list. And then they select the one that's appropriate. And then the whole screen changes to support the, support the agent and take them to the, uh, the task that they need to work on. So you could right click. Maybe there's something around a profile change or a, or a billing item, like a billing payment, and you click on that. And then the idea is to have the whole, uh, the whole screen change and maintain all that within one pane of glass. So the next step really is uh, after we've done the transition, uh, we need to provide that process assistance and guidance. Um, so in the one pane uh, of glass kind of idea, we need to 
just show them what they need to get the job done. Um, so if your system of engagement, your CRM has has flows like uh, like Salesforce does, for example, then use that mechanism to navigate the agent through each step in the flow to support the task. And that way the screen can be focused you know, on one step at a time and it narrows down um, what needs to be shown and helps prevent the agent from having to hunt around um, for uh, to different tabs or different things to find what they need to do. If you're using a tab-based system, um, like in the previous example was a customer using SAP, then try and narrow it down to one tab, maybe two tabs. And that, that's all that the agent needs to focus on. And it's kind of funny, we still see this with, with larger consulting firms that might be doing broader, um, uh, maybe business transformation type projects across all sorts of divisions in an organization tend to forget that the contact center kind of has some special needs. Um, and some of those needs are really that because we're dealing with that sort of volume model and trying to process things uh, efficiently, um, we need to, to have special attention paid to, to how the agents work. And what we've seen a lot is uh, situations where the, the CRM system is not modified and the agents have to hunt and pack around different tabs, um, different pages, and maybe even different applications. And it really slows the, the agent down. And that was done because they implemented all the capability for, for doing processes within the company. These consulting companies have, have done that. And then it, they haven't really looked at what, um, what the contact center should do. Uh, and that results in loss of wasted time, a lot of wasted time, and causes errors as well. And that's that's a problem. So the other thing to focus on are things like uh, hiding the soft phone. Very, it's a small thing, but hiding the soft phone also implies that you might embed some of that soft phone functionality into the process or into the the um, the screen or the CRM. So click to dial is a pretty simple example of that. Um, but that can be important so they don't have to move back and forth from, from one part to the other or chew up real estate with the soft phone. So next, talk about a couple of big areas, um, just kind of new emerging areas really. So first is to learn about uh, VEAs. It's an acronym. It's a Virtual Employee Assistance. And this is something that's coming out that's new, uh, basically out of the chatbot world. Um, so it's an AI-powered chatbot that can augment the agent in, in a few different ways. And it can augment the agent by acting like their digital buddy um, and help them answer questions you know, from a knowledge base. It could answer things like, um, you know, when is their next bill? Or show me the last three purchases they made over $500. Or um, what was the, you know, did they open a ticket about a certain product? You can basically use it like a like um, a chatbot and ask it questions. And this is the intelligent piece where it will go through um, and really adapt to the agent as opposed to the agent having to um, figure out where necessarily all that information resides. Even further is the VEA could listen to the conversation and present um, relevant information uh, to the agent as it moves along. So it picks up about billing info Hearing that in the conversation, that could move that information forward uh, to the agent. Um, next thing is to talk about something called best next action. You may have heard of it uh, before, or best next offer, which is the sales equivalent to that. Sometimes called next best action. Everybody seems to like the N or the B in front. Uh, this is an AI-powered uh, uh, capability to guide and uh, make suggestions to the agent on what to do next. Um, using AI and customer and contextual information, so that context, uh, sentiment analysis, uh, historical information, and use all that to try and suggest steps for the agent, what they can follow. An example of this is Salesforce has done this um, and started to do this a little bit. It looks a bit like a script. I might show and project the CSAT score that that could be a, 
a potential result of this, um, and then shows certain options that the agent could take to improve that score, uh, that potential outcome. And it can it can provide that that uh, capability. Now this is it's in its infancy, um, but it's starting to be another area of of AI uh, engagement here that uh, that we're seeing. And we'll talk about uh, next is uh, task automation. And so task automation comes from uh, really leveraging some of the the self service bots that might be customer facing but making them agent facing as well so that the agent could either use them or direct the customer uh, to them. So things like if it was a password reset or a payment are pretty obvious examples where the agent doesn't have to do all that manual work, it could provide and send the customer off to a bot uh, or even an IVR to, uh, to handle some of those, those things, either to complete it or to come back to the agent and, uh, and continue. Um, other automation capabilities are uh, filling in fields, so agents don't have to copy paste and have that error uh, situation. Um, and uh, uh, you could have a connected uh, bot, the VEA, that could not just listen like we talked about before, but uh, also supply information. Um, so if it sounds like it's about a an address change or a phone number change and the customer's speaking that, then that information could be presented through transcription uh, and made available. So they could either copy it from, from that without error or even figure out which field it should go in and populate the field. Um, so assisted wrap-up is uh, another area of automation where you can help the, the agent with um, wrapping up the interaction. So again, auto-filling the fields that they might do during wrap-up but um, uh, also could be uh, automated. So if you complete an actual transaction, you know, purchase gets done or refund gets made or something like that, and the CRM system can definitively know that, you could also have an automatic uh, reason code get, get added to that. And this can save time and increase the accuracy, um, and increasing the accuracy improves that uh, understanding for, um, for customer, uh, sorry, for the the operations and management team. So yeah, so with that, um, I think we can move to the to the question. Go ahead. Great. And David, Great. Sure. Yeah, our uh, poll question today is really just kind of where you are in the journey. Um, it reads, uh, when was the last time you made improvements to your contact center to specifically enable your agents? Uh, early on in the um, in the uh, content that uh, Noel was sharing, there was a question about agent enablement. What did that mean? And then a comment came and said, you don't need to ask that. I've got it now. So uh, if others of you were um, uh, going down that same question of what do you mean by agent enablement, I think, Noel, you did a great job of kind of giving a high level of, of what all that could mean. But as it comes back to the poll question, uh, you know, just give us your best guess on you know where you are uh, in that journey, and my, my suspicion is you've done some work, you've tried some things, some things didn't work, and maybe uh, some of that back and forth will come out in the Q&A. So it's, it's for fun that we get your uh, perspective, and it does help know, uh, gauge where our audience is during the Q&A session. So please participate, and uh, Noel, take a moment. Um, well, I'll leave that up here for a while, but we'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thanks, David. So, am I off mute? I'll make sure I'm off mute. <laughs> uh, all right. So, with this this slide, so now it's kind of getting into some summary stuff. Um, you know, I, I took a, uh, a bit of a dive, uh, deeper dive into um, some specifics. I started off the talk um, talking about um, saying I wanted to get into this, you know, the agent enablement and and kind of really what what that that means overall was. The, those five those five circles um, I, I looked at earlier, but more specifically, I wanted to look at the the systems and the processes, and narrow narrow it down to that as to what I was looking at. And the reason for narrowing down to what I did cover is because um, of things like this question, which is actually a survey question that gets asked um, to uh, to employees. By um, by some uh, some companies, and one of the things I found with this one, so most of the systems and processes here 
support us, the agents, getting our work done effectively. And the scoring of that, the threshold, is quite low at 55 to 65 percent. And a lot of the other questions on this and other surveys will score higher, like if you're at 70 or 75 percent, or questions like, is it a good place to work, should score quite high to, to have an effect. This one was on the lower end. So it just looked like companies are struggling um, with this. And, um, and so this is the, the reason I tried to, to jump into this more specific area of systems and, and process improvements for uh, better enabling agents. Now this question is, uh, is part of something that you might ask your agents if you're doing, doing surveys, and we'll get to that a little later on. So it's an example of uh, a voice of the employee type of, uh, type of question. All right, so summarize a little bit again, um, kind of what we're going, going for here, is I wanted to, with what was covered, is focus on the, the customer conversation and the business process. That's really what we want the agent to be focused on. So as part of this vision of what an agent experience should, should contain, um, you really want to make sure that you're not in the way of the agent and um, that you, you really just are there to support with everything and let their attention uh, shift to, the, to what they need to focus on. The next thing is um, having meaningful data. So we talked about the visibility, the 360-degree view being important in order for them to identify uh, what it is that they need to do. So you need to have that data, it needs to be complete, it needs to be available immediately, and it needs to be available throughout um, the, uh, the interaction. So that's the second part. And then lastly, I just want to emphasize again the sort of support and assist of the agent, that augmentation of the agent, and that also should be done really throughout from the authentication and the early step to you know, the process uh, uh, support or task support. Um, that the agent's trying to do with that uh, with that customer. Um, yeah, so then I think we can shift gears a little bit. Uh, talk um, in the next last two slides here, focused on uh, the more the management side. So I promised at the beginning we talked a little bit about this with the management piece. So we looked at um, with the CX improvements uh, that companies might make. Uh, a couple of key areas, adding channels and, and adding bots for self-service. Uh, that changes the, um, the interaction mix, the, the bots do in particular. And by changing the interaction mix with those bots taking on those simpler, um, those simpler transactions and handling those, it's leaving a higher percentage of the, the um, transactions for, uh, for agents to handle. And so that's going to affect your pool of agents. Um, with with that change and your 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 agent pool is therefore going to going to likely change and so here's a, a graph um, want to kind of review now this is an example of, of some data I think different companies are going to have to do their own I wouldn't view this as too broad too broad an example of of um, what's going on out there but but it could be and it, and it could apply to you and it's that the mix of agents, um, uh, the mix of an agent's work is, is changing. And with that, though, the impression that, that agents have is uh, that they like the easy work. Um, they're not too bad with the moderate work. And you know, a good half of them are not really so happy with the complex work. And guess what? As bots and things take on more of the complex work, uh, sorry, more of the easy work, and agents will end up with more of the category that they like the least, at least in, in, in this survey. So what can you kind of do about this and, and uh, the sort of happiness factor um, if agents are, are, are looking like this? Because um, if this change happens and your pool stays the same and you've got a scoring kind of like this, then likely your agent uh, churn is going to go up. So that could be uh, even more of a problem with agent churn if we don't don't look to address this. Um, so what are a couple of things that we can do? Uh, a few things we can do is we can try and reduce the complexity. So some of the stuff that I covered uh, before the question, 
the poll question is things that you can look at to try and reduce the complexity. And if by trying to reduce the complexity, you're really trying to shift the agent's view of that last um, uh, that last column, the complex column, maybe to more of a moderate, and that can help with uh, with the agent perception. You can also increase engagement directly through other things like the workspace, uh, chairs and monitors, headsets, um, you know, other things like shift swapping, or even some work at home capability. We have one one customer who kind of awards their agents with uh, with some ability to to work from home. And then of course that leaves us with the changing mix um, of your pool of agents. And so with that you kind of have to understand your pool, you have to understand the agent personas that you're dealing with and really in a way what your score like this is. Um, and then you're going to want to target new employees uh, and change some of that hiring practice to target personas that are okay and maybe even enjoy the the, the complex uh, aspect, the, the challenges of, uh, of the workplace and the work that they do. So there are different personas and you might have to shift to make sure you're targeting that, that right persona. And so to figure this out, um, we get into things, a uh, relatively new thing around the voice of the employee and maybe setting up a program, voice of the employee type program. And this is largely similar to what you might think of for a voice of the customer uh, type of program. And so there are a few things that you'll probably want to do when, when setting this up. Uh, the first thing is that, well, with anything, if you're going to set up a program that might show that you're willing to listen to your agents and, and uh, understand what, uh, what ways you can um, get them to be more engaged is that you have the ability to take action. So either a good working relationship with IT or some support there, um, and that's where the IT buy-in comes in. Um, and, uh, and then from that ability, knowing that you can take some level of action, now you can define your program a bit more. You can look at the goal, um, what the, the metrics are that you want to uh, to consider, so like an agent SAT type of score. And you want to compare your score with your level of attrition, agent attrition that you're getting. And you want to measure that. You can measure it by doing surveys. And surveys should not be done sort of at an annual level. I don't know, that seems to be a, um, something that's maybe more trending or more of something we've seen. But do it more at a, at a quarterly level, uh, a little bit more frequently. And um, maybe even could consider things like on um, some of the interactions that, that pop up. Maybe uh, some of what the desktop could do is you know, ask them about how difficult the customer was to to handle and what they thought about the the interaction. Maybe it's like a smiley face, frowny face kind of a kind of um, bit of data that they can quickly click on and move on to the uh, to the next um, next interaction. So about trying to find those places to to collect that data, that direct data, and then use some of the other information you might have to infer uh, what uh, what your agents are, are thinking. Then of course when you get those those results, you're going to want to look at them and take some level of action, and then from that action you're going to want to monitor over time that uh, that progress is being made and that that agent SAT score is is progressing. So then on the, the buy-in side, I mentioned about IT uh, and specifically you know, management, of course, too, in terms of setting this up, making sure there's, there's buy-in within the, the contact center or customer service team that, that you belong to. Um, but also on the IT side, and this can be a challenge, because IT could, um, uh, could really be more in their infrastructure approach of really doing things kind of their way and the big, big projects that have to be well-defined. So we're seeing that sort of shift now with, with IT organizations providing small agile teams that are essentially connected to the customer, uh, sorry, to the business unit and making changes to help the business unit um, improve things for the customer as they, as they move forward. And they might even have an API team as well. So that's another in between the, the front end team that's helping the, the business units um, help their customers you might have an in-between team that also deals with the infrastructure 
team uh, underneath it that's maybe doing projects over longer periods of time. And their role might be to provide certain tools and things across the different infrastructure uh, systems that uh, your IT organization has and make those available to uh, the business units to, to provide solutions uh, quickly. Um, so yeah, so that kind of wraps it up. Um, and I think uh, we can, we can uh, have you, David, take it from there. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You know, I have, uh, I don't know that I've taken this many notes uh, throughout a webinar. You've really introduced some new concepts and uh, added some, uh, some context to the things that have been discussed, uh, you know, that we've been following over the last six, nine months. Let's start off with the uh, results of the poll question. And uh, Noel, if you wouldn't mind uh, adding your comments to this. Is this what you're seeing? Does it fit with uh, what you're hearing? So again, the poll question, when was the last time you made improvements to your contact center to specifically enable your agents? Looks like a little over half of the people that responded are saying, hey, we're, we're working on this right now. And another 22% or about a quarter other respondents said, uh, you know, it's 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 on the it's on the front burner. It's in the near future, and the uh, the rest of the folks said it's been some time. So I'm kind of summarizing it there. But is uh, does that give you any uh, thought or perspective, Noel? Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. It's good to good to hear that um, at least on the planning and execution side that there's a lot of of activity and focus on the on the on the agent. Um, that's probably kind of in line with what what I was hoping to hear. <laughs> sure. Um, and then, yeah, and then I think for those that that aren't, um, if uh, depending on whether they've just recently completed things or um, or that, I, I do feel that the agent enablement piece is an ongoing uh, effort, and that really what happens is um, in any any projects that you might be launching, you might want to look at. Uh, what piece you might carve off or include to uh, to help the agents along with that. It's pretty pretty rare, I think, that um, some of those uh, customer engagement center contact center projects um, don't have a uh, an agent element. It, it can be that maybe the systems are good in some cases. You don't need to recode or rework stuff. You've got it sort of configurable. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, that probably lies with with um, what I was hoping to see. Excellent. Well, we we've already got a, several questions thrown into the uh, the bucket, so I remind all of you out there, and there's a bunch of you. Uh, please use that questions box. We'll get to all that we can today, and uh, certainly post webinar follow up and get you some answers. Uh, so, kicking things off, uh, first question. Again, great place to start too. Uh, you know what? What should be my first step when considering um, our organizational needs to make changes to enable agents? So, for those people who are looking at it down the road or or haven't gotten to it in years, can you give some best practice around first steps? Um, yeah, I think um, I think there are a few things to to look at. One is I think. Because the focus is on customer experience first, uh, I still still believe that should be the the main focus. That you'd need to go back to your CSAT score or whatever CX metrics that you're using, and then you know look at are you below where you want to be or at where you want to be, and 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 kind of the the level of improvement that you that um, is kind of your opportunity there, and then you want to list. Um, what what you're doing today with the agents? So maybe going back to to the stuff that I talked about earlier is how much of that um, are you doing? Kind of how far along uh, are you? How much opportunity is there to enable the agent? And then with how much opportunity there is to enable the agent, and how much um, sort of CSAT scoring room you might you might have, that might give you an indication of um, of whether to focus on uh, on the agent side versus something else. Um, probably want to also make sure that you're you have good access to your IT team to be able to execute on on those. And I'd ask the agents. I think you'd you'd want to 
either do a survey or even small groups and talk to them. Um, I think those would be key things to, to look at for figuring out where to where to move to. Yeah, that last point is uh, is one well taken. We hear that quite often. Um, you can't get enough feedback from your agent. You really can't, and it'll uh, it'll be enlightening uh, at the least. So, um, let me get to the next question here. Uh, this this is a long one, so bear with me. It seems like whenever we provide more for our agents, you know, a new technology or tool comes out that we can't keep up with, uh, what's the best way to anticipate future changes to the industry so we're implementing the most long-term solutions possible? I guess there's a lot in that question, but uh, I'll let you kind of tackle mm -hmm. it however you feel. Yeah, so I think um, the key thing is sort of anticipating those future changes. That's definitely um, a challenge. and. Um, yeah, kind of keeping up with 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 things. So, I'd say the the first probably the first thing even before looking into the future is kind of that where are you at now bit, um, which I think I've seen a few questions float by on that. Um, but sort of where are you at now, and if you have that struggle of uh, the technology that you have today or some of the the more more common and mature technologies, then it might be difficult to even start to launch into the new. So probably in in that situation, you want to keep an eye on new technology. Uh, and for that, I'd recommend definitely looking at bots if you're not doing that, um, self-service bots um, across channels. So voice for you know an IVR replacement maybe, and uh, also across other ch uh, chat channels um, such as the web chat or or um, uh, SMS, for example. Um, and then I think it's uh, focus on, you know, keep your attention on the, the, the customer experience scoring and um, look for that, that low-hanging fruit on, the, on those current changes you can make while keeping an eye on the new technology. And then, yeah, I think if you've got the opportunity, bots are definitely a, a hot topic. I'd still say they're sort of in their adolescent stage. Um, and so likely that's being considered by an organization. So I would guess that something that, if you haven't heard it, it that's going to come at you is, um, is enabling uh, bots. And so you have to enable your agents properly if you're introducing bots. This is something that we see as a problem. We've actually seen bots be implemented on websites with a customer that doesn't even have chat capability for their agents. So you really want to make sure that there's that flow um, if something goes wrong or the bot can't handle it, that you can flow that to the agent, and that's a new experience um, for the agent across those channels. So I know it probably Great. covers a few things for that question. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. One comment here I'd like to make, you know, uh, automation of that often, uh, uh, authentic, authentication process. That's not easy for me to say. But as you um, uh, go through that, we recently had to do this with our bank and doing a wire transfer. And I know we went through uh, two stages. Um, they said, okay, everything's good. And then they called back. And of course, you go through all five stages. And they said, okay, we're good to go. And then they called back for one more question. And you go through five more stages. So, you know, anything that you can uh, to do to, to, to streamline that process, certainly gives the customer a better experience, but I, I would think that it's also painful on the agent side. Um, so that's that was just, just you struck a chord with me recently. Um, next question, mm -hmm. do you find that organizations want to add more channels but struggle with their existing channels to deliver a good customer experience? In other words, organizations get up in keeping up with, they get caught up uh, keep it up with the Joneses here. Yeah. So, do you find do you find that? Get, what are your thoughts around that? Um, they want to add more channels. Yeah. So, I think it's what's leading to that wanting to add more channels. Um, adding more channels, if it's for trying to make things easier for the agent, sorry, easier for the customer to reach into agents and you know provide that accessibility, that ease of accessibility to your customers. As long as that's well founded in terms of those channels are selected properly and, and not just you know for you want to you want to get onto WhatsApp support or something like that for fun, and that's really where your customers are, then you do have a business challenge that you you need to 
to handle that with um, uh, with your customer base. But if you're struggling with existing channels, there there might be a, a few things. Um, if if email is one of them, um, email is is a dying channel. It's also considered uh, expensive. So, you know, I would recommend you know trying to look at processes that would change you know the use of email and maybe reduce it to a notification approach versus an actual you know doing a transaction. There might be things where maybe you should shrink usage of some of your existing existing channels. Um, and then I think what I covered in the Omnichannel webinar a bit is that I think there's a huge lift and a huge impact to organizations that just do voice and then move into voice and then chat. But once you've got chat platform and you've got that chat capability for your agents, it should be easier to add the next chat channel uh, as long as the chat was implemented right um, and uh, and the agent's uh, capabilities are are handled. So I probably focus on you know that that piece there that um, the voice versus chat is a is that big step. And if you can overcome that hurdle, then hopefully the other other changes um, for ch new channels will be easier. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions here. Uh, this one reads: How do you determine if the enablement changes you made were effective? Yeah, isn't that the million dollar question? Um, so that can be a bit of, of, of trial and error with um, with what you're what you're measuring and, and looking at the at the stats that you have. Uh, I would say that really what you're going to want to do is figure out uh, the measurement in terms of things like your CSAT score, whatever CX metric that you're using, you really want to move the metric on some of these, what I sometimes call goal goal metrics. They're the metrics that are the big picture metrics. But then you do want to look at what I'd consider to be activity metrics or things that you look at um, that, that are more um, specific. So maybe looking at, you know, time time spent per, you know, per interaction. Now, don't manage your agents to to that, but you know, you're looking for that for efficiency. You'd be looking for um, data inside your your um, system in terms of how well those transactions are are um, uh, are being rated. Um, so yeah, you've really got to match those activity metrics to those goal metrics, and that that's actually something we're trying to better define because uh, we're viewing this as one of the probably the biggest problems that um, that organizations are having. And everybody seems to be looking at the data differently or storing the data differently, and that's really where some of the challenge lies. Well, this ties right into that. Um, this is a comment that says, I believe the challenge for organizations to use bots to augment agents will require organizations to resolve their information landfill of processes and procedures. Otherwise, bots will only deliver wrong and inconsistent information to both agents and customers. This dictates leveraging a methodology to create an accurate single source of truth. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that gets to uh, I mentioned very briefly in the in the beginning um, some of the areas of improvement that organizations would be looking at. And one of those I call it this is sort of the silo problem. The the process and data and system silos that that exist. So you might be siloed in one or all three of those those ways, um, and that can provide uh, problems. And that is the I'd say the Achilles heel to any sort of uh, intelligent automation. But I'd also say it's a problem when I talked about the 360 degree view of the customer and presenting that to your agent. That even without the bots. I, I think that's a problem. You might not be presenting uh, all the information uh, consistently to the agent for them to be be doing the work, um, or you're basically using the agent as the integration point. So instead of integrating your systems, you're using your agent as a systems integrator, and they might be using three different apps and going to diff three different apps, and they have to coalesce the data themselves. So I actually use that term sometimes. I don't know if it'll work for you, but you know, who do you want doing being the systems integrator of your of your data and your processes? Do you want that to be your agent, or do you want that to be inside your organization? So, so that's uh, 
that's a problem, and, and it's a constant thing that's being worked on. That we're seeing more activity there, mm -hmm. integrating those systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got time for one more question, and and really, this is just uh, a quick answer. Would be great. Um, frequency. How often should we be making changes focused on agents and service reps? Well, uh, I would, you know, in, in a in the perfect world, um, I think what pe what we should be striving for is a change to the approach and how IT works with the business. And when I talked about those those um, business focused teams working on changes, um, I would say that they'd be a group constantly working on on making changes. And those changes would be in you know anywhere from two week to eight week uh, increments, maybe multiple sprints, two or three week sprints and constantly moving that, that progress along. And that is a bit of an issue in that it's not really kind of an ROI model um, that you can, say, justify the, you know, a team if you, if you don't have this kind of philosophy in your organization. You know, what, what you might be able to do is sometimes after a, a large project, um, what we sometimes try to do is say you need to have kind of a I will call it maybe a cleanup project or a cleanup phase, but you want to have a follow-on phase that as you've launched whatever changes, you might learn stuff from going into production and and need a small team to be able to make those adjustments for uh, 60 to 90 days post-project. So if if you guys use that model, if anybody here you know kind of has that, here's a post-project team that's going to do some of those changes. If you can try and keep that team alive and show benefit uh, improvements to to management, you might be able to kind of carve out a bit of a team, or show show value in that team and and get something going. But yeah, there's a, a credit card company that um, that we uh, that we know that actually has about 150 teams of about two to three people each working in their with their different business units um, from the IT side, but just constantly making changes on an ongoing basis in those sort of two to eight, maybe in their case up to 12 week sort of increments, um, not considered IT infrastructure type projects of 15 months or 18 months. It's really trying to shift that mentality to be dynamic um, and allow your business to be dynamic and follow the customer. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, uh, it's never boring in the world of contact center and customer care. and. Uh, we do appreciate the information that you've provided today and given us a lot to think about. Uh, you've referenced more than once uh, a recent webinar you did for our, uh, our group uh, on Omnichannel and um, some of the things to consider. I believe we have a link to it. There's a number of other reference links uh, attached to this webinar, so please make note of that if you are um, interested in that content. We also had a video chat with Noel, so that's that's something we're going to do more of as we continue to um, uh, to bring more and more content. Uh, our flow and process will improve and change this year. Uh, we're looking to bring more and more content on a weekly basis. So uh, we appreciate the audience today. Thanks for joining us. Um, a few reminders. Uh, we can carry the conversation over to our CC&G group. So if we didn't get to your question, you want to post it there. We'll make sure we get you an answer. Um, and the presentation slides, of course, are a part of the uh, reference material attached to the webinar here today. Uh, visit ccng.com for more details on our upcoming programs and events. And we, of course, welcome you to share your thoughts about this using your social channels. Please include at RES Solutions when you do that. We would appreciate it, as well as at CCNG Network. So, Again, uh, Noel, it's always an education when we uh, have time with you. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking time for the membership and all the colleagues and peers that have participated today. And you, the audience, thank you for hanging in there. Great questions. More to come on this, I can assure you. Noel, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>